This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Dr. Michael Spence. He's a professor at Emeritus at Stanford University, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, a Nobel laureate from, I believe, the year was 2001. He's won the John Bates Clark Award. He's the co-chair of the Commission on Global Economic Transformation for INET and is, uh, how to say, if I'm trying to shed a light on things, there's nobody I turn to before Mike Spence. So, Mike, thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much, Rob. It's a pleasure. We're here to talk about things in the final stage of the India leadership of the G20 as it pertains to climate, global south, global challenges, and particularly the challenges that the nation, India, a very large nation with tremendous potential and lots of unusual innovation has, uh, how would I say, put, put in front of the world. And uh, we're interested in, Mike, your perspective on how to align, illuminate, and what, what might I call, create a anxiety alleviating and prosperity enhancing strategy in the next phase. Uh, Mike, you uh, were the head of the Growth Commission at the World Bank years ago, and he has a new book out with Muhammad al arian and Gordon Brown. It's, oh, it's not out yet, it will be coming out, called Permacrisis, which I've had the good fortune to read and learn from in these last few days, and it's, it's a very constructive and exciting creation. And uh, I, I want to pre-congratulate you on that on that offering. Thank you so much, Rob. Uh, so, we, we hope it helps people. So, so in the big picture, where are we? We've got questions of climate, national security, inequality or social sustainability within nations and between nations. And we've and we've left the what I will call a phase that W. Arthur Lewis talked about in the transformation particularly of China, where people move to the urban areas and higher areas and, and leave the farms. But at any rate, I don't want to go on much further. Where do you think we are, Mike? And then we'll zoom in on Global South, particularly climate issues and, and India. Well, you know, there's several parts to it. You know, we lived, uh, we lived in a world uh, for 30 years or so, maybe more, um, in which we had very powerful what are usually called deflationary forces, which to me, when translated, means we had extraordinarily large amounts of productive capacity brought into the global economy um, by because of the extraordinary growth in emerging economies. India began this journey, uh, you know, in kind of full throttle in the at the start of the 90s, China only slightly earlier. Um, but anyway, the effect of that was that we had we just lived in a world in which no matter what happened to the demand side, the supply side kept up, <laughs> essentially. And uh, and so it was a world that where inflation wasn't a particular concern. I mean, there were, you know, there, there were always exceptions. There were pockets where governments printed money and that led to inflation or hyperinflation, and that's not good. But in general, um, we lived in a world, we have a generation of people who have basically never lived in a high inflation environment or one where inflation is a serious concern. I think that world is, you know, rapidly disappearing behind us in the, in the rear room mirror, Rob. Um, so in much of the world now, 75 or more percent of the global economy, we have aging. That's not true in India. It's not true in a lot of countries. But, uh, but if you just look at it where, in terms of where the GDP comes from, we have labor shortages in advanced countries, especially in the U.S. You know, we have geopolitical tensions. We have shocks to the system. We have a very powerful um, new set of, uh, you know, incentives with respect to diversification of supply chains, which is an expensive process, depending on how you do it. Um, more concerns about economic security as well as national security. It's just a different world. And when you add it up, you know, it's a, it's a world where inflation will be a threat. The cost of capital may be higher. The in, when we level off on interest rates, we don't know, but that may be higher. 
And so I think the first thing for people to understand is we can't assume, you know, even though it's a natural human tendency that, you know, despite all these shocks, somehow we're going to manage to get back to where we were, you know, in the in the relatively recent past. I, I don't think that's going to happen. Anyway, it's a debatable subject, but so, so that's kind of piece one. Piece two is that and you and I have talked about this a lot, that we're just extraordinarily powerful scientific and technological developments, which if we find a way to use them properly, are at least tools that we can use to solve really challenging problems like climate change, like declining productivity, like a supply constrained world, um, et cetera, like financial Plus, inclusion. Global health care. <laughs> <laughs> and global health care. Yeah, I mean, yes. and th these things come in the biomedical, you know, in life sciences. They come in, you know, digital, which everybody talks about, especially now that we have generative AI, um, which is, really is a stunning, stunning breakthrough um, for a number of reasons we may want to talk about kind of later on. But um, and so when you know, before, you know, sort of cycling into depression, <laughs> You know, I think the, the the way I look at it is we've got these powerful tools. Let's, you know, focus on thinking about how we're going to use them to solve these big challenges that we face, you know, slow and declining growth, et cetera. And we'll talk more about what these problems are and how you go about dealing with them. But th but that's kind of the general frame of reference that, uh, that I go into this with, at least on the economic side. I mean, uh, we you know, setting aside governance and so on, um, I think there's a pretty tough couple of years coming in the global economy because none of these things get done overnight. But when you go beyond that, then I think, you know, you have multiple scenarios and some of them look pretty, pretty, um, pretty attractive, but it's going to take the combined effort of an awful lot of people in business and government and civil society and in international cooperation um, to get there. Mm -hmm. And we've come from an era, which many call the neoliberal era, where we've said the best thing government can do is get out of the way and let the market solve it. Yep. And it feels to me from the reading I've done of your draft and permacrisis and so forth, like the next chapter may call for, which you might call a different kind of chef in the kitchen. Uh, we, Absolutely right. We, yeah. we've, got, we've got some different challenges now. In climate, yeah. obviously, with the public goods, both uh, within the community where there are fossil fuels having negative side effects and the global ramifications in a globalized society where national governments have to function vis-a-vis -vis climate for the benefit of all humankind. The, uh, yeah. the, the, yeah. the, the, the it's a new it's a new era. For sure. You can easily talk yourself into a state of depression when you look at kind of global carbon dioxide production based emissions, right? They're still at best they're they're still going up. <laughs> and they're just way, way higher than anything that's kind of reasonably kind of within the bounds of safety in the long term. And we're now experiencing, you know, what most people believe are serious climate events. And it does. I think, you know, people are right. I mean, there's lots of challenges, but the, the biggest and most complex one that we have to deal with is that one, because it involves literally everybody on the planet. It involves every country and government. It involves the way we interact with each other internationally. Um, and it has huge distributional issues, which we have a long track record of not be, not being able to handle very well. Um, so I think that one <clears throat> legitimately gets to the top of the list in terms of magnitude of challenge and complexity. Um, I don't think it's time to give up, um, but I think it's probably realistic to think that we are going to live with climate change for a significant period of time. You, you can't, there's no scenario that's reasonable that takes the carbon um, emissions down at a speed that would essentially cause the climate uh, you know, issue to go away. Uh, it's just not possible. Maybe 25 years ago, if we were on a different glide path, that would have been possible, but not, but not now. I, I think if that's true, then, you know, and this is not news. I mean, you know, there's discussions at every one of the COP meetings about 
these distributional issues, at least on an international basis. And uh, Gordon Brown, if he were here, would say, you know, we've made a lot of promises and haven't delivered on, on most of them. You know, there was a hundred billion dollar promise with respect to, you know, climate mitigation and adaptation with respect to lower income countries. And we haven't really delivered that yet. So we got a lot of work to do. Uh, but that, but that, but, but that, that's a kind of, at least on the climate front, that's, that, that's where we are. I think climate, you know, will probably get to be on the agenda of legitimately on the agenda of every internet, major international group meeting uh, for the foreseeable future. Yeah. One, one thing I wanted to emphasize also that is in your book is that we have a very interesting pattern of aging in many countries. So you have a smaller based workforce with supply shocks and higher interest rates, the need to finance climate and what I'll call more people needing elder care and the support that perhaps they think they earned during their working life. And uh, then we have a very young population in Africa but it doesn't have the, what I'll call systems, whether it's education, coordination, and so forth, yet in place. But as you said in, in your introduction, the digital potential could create a very happy ending for the invigoration of the African continent and also uh, what you might call obviate the fears of large-scale migration as their population grows. Yeah, no, I think this is right. Now, so the starting point's pretty tough because the pandemic um, and, oh, yeah. you know, and all of that produced a, an enormous shock. Uh, so, I mean, all countries face major challenges, as you and I have discussed, in kind of generating a kind of growth model that works and so on. But with these external shocks for which, you know, nobody was responsible and certainly not the global south, uh, you know, destabilized finances, it destabil you know, reduced fiscal space because, you know, everybody had to respond. Um, the global economy sort of semi shut down and so on. So I think item one, you know, if item one is sort of a, a concerted effort to stabilize, <clears throat> you know, the debt and kind of financial situation of these countries so that they can get on um, with uh with you know pursuing their growth and development agenda the item 2 rob i think is you know i said that you know in describing what you referred to as the 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 arthur lewis model i described this once kind of by analogy as a kind of lewis turning point in the global economy but how fast that turn really depends on whether or not the very populous global south you know, finds a way to connect to the global economy um, and be part of the supply side. Uh, so what I describe as a relatively sharp turning point might be less sharp if we can solve that problem. Um, and I think that's worth a, a fair amount of attention. You know, what, what incentives do we need to create? How do we reduce sort of perceived risks so the costs of capital aren't as high as they are in these countries? This, by the way, applies to climate change as well. Right. You know, a lot of climate change investment is going to be very capital intensive, I would say. Uh, and so cost of capital becomes a, a kind of first order important parameter in, you know, with respect to, you know, doing this. The example I use is solar. Uh, so solar looks like an awfully attractive, you know, um, technology for part of the electricity generation system, but it looks less attractive if you have costs of capital that are double or triple, you know, what you find in the um, advanced, you know, markets, uh, financial markets. So so if we did both of those things, that is, we, you know, you made a serious commitment to stabilizing countries that are, you know, shaky because they got shot, hit by these the pandemic and other shocks. The climate shocks keep coming and coming and coming. Um, and then, and then, um, you know, say, well, you know, the Asian growth model is not going to get replicated in its exact form, you know, in the kind of digital era. But, but the connectivity to the global economy and finding a role is still an important part of the growth development process. And, and th that, I think, deserves to, 
deserves a lot of attention and to be on the agenda as well. One thing that uh, has concerned me, uh, both in following your work and, and thinking about this, is the nature of governance in the Global South, but let's talk about Africa. You have these climate needs, in part because of the pandemic, you have very high sovereign debt ratios. You have some people allocating capital, not thinking of it as a public good, but worried about default risk in these high debt countries. <laughs> and you have people concerned about the, what I call risk premiums that the capital gets allocated to where it should. I know my friends and who I greatly admire at the Mo Ibrahim Foundation were cited in your book about the what you might call quality and integrity of governance. And that's not a criticism of the African people. That's about an interactive North-South system that may have gotten a little out of balance. But to get this climate work allocated in the direction that, and at the scale that we need in this equatorial region, there may be these other dimensions that have to be addressed to ensure that capital flows are part of the public good and they go where they're directed. Yes. So the capital requirements, you know, with respect to the the um, the, the sustainability energy transition agenda are, you know, very large. I mean, I, I don't know. There's a whole bunch of estimates, but let's pick one. Three points. $5 trillion a year for an extended multi-decade period of time. Well, that's not all going to come from government, you know, not with high interest rates and, you know, maybe higher for longer and high and rising sovereign debt ratios that are part of the legacy of the pandemic. But there are huge pools of capital uh, in the private sector. Uh, and so I think the, the way that's starting to be thought of is it's a huge challenge um, to sort of mobilize that private sector. And in this context, let me mention, I mean, a very talented an Indian American or Indian by background, now American, Ajay Banga is the head of the World Bank. Um, I think he's, you know, basically exactly on target. He's set himself the goal of uh, dealing with sustainability and dealing with the kind of growth challenges. And he's kind of got, it's kind of right in the center of what we're talking about now. I think he's, what he's going to try to do, this is just a personal opinion. I haven't talked to him for, you know, several months is he's going to try to show that you can use the bank's balance sheet, the, the world bank's balance sheet, essentially to adjust the incentives and start to mobilize this capital. And if I think if he succeeds, um, then the entire G20 world ought to get behind them and a number of other international institutions and increase the capitalization a lot. I mean, okay. And so I think it's fair to say, you know, prove the model out. I think that's the direction he's going. Um, if he proves the model out and, you know, with various kinds of risk mitigating incentives, you, you know, using his balance sheet, um, if we mobilize, you know, huge pools of sovereign de sovereign wealth fund capital and and pension fund capital and so on, I can see we could make, you know, serious inroads into this investment challenge with respect to the, I mean, there's lots of technological activity that's really interesting going on um, in the, in the sustainability world. Um, but there's, but the people who are investing in that world have come to realize that there's also some sort of just huge kind of infrastructure like investments that have to go along with the technological mm -hmm. development to fully solve the problem. So, um, so I'm kind of cautiously optimistic about that because I think people are thinking about it in the right way, right? You know, mm -hmm. in a realistic way, not just we got to invest $3.5 million a year, who's going to do it? But, you know, where's the money and what do we need to create the incentives to, to mobilize it? And I know you're and my friends at the Lujan Academy who are currently working with INET on a multi-part course about how digital technology can help climate right. mitigation and, and yeah. uh, create some optimism here. Uh, I, I think they have a lot of insights. They do have a lot of insights. That's really important. I mean, we've talked about it a lot, but I think a course, you know, designed for the kind of right people to kind of look, you know, we won't wave our hands at this. Let's look at what the real options are as they emerge, you know, and the technology mm -hmm. develops. But I think that it's very promising.
Mm -hmm. But then they tend, with their technological expertise, to see where the realistic good fits are. So I, I find them, the reason I chose to make the course with them is because I admire their ability to prioritize and illuminate Absolutely. at the same time. Yep, yep. And there's no reason why this can't go on in a whole variety of places. I mean, including India, especially. There's just a ton of talent uh, and, you know, deployed in this area. It, it, um, they could make a major contribution as well. The young mm -hmm. people, the technology oriented people who, you know, find it easy to, you know, be creative in the way you think about using the technology. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a word that's used frequently in your book. Uh, that has come on stream, particularly as the U.S.-China tensions have arisen, resilience. And it's, it's almost as if you have to create a, a contingent insurance policy for your supply inputs, or the, whether it's semiconductor chips or what have you. But the notion of resiliency, I think, has become very interesting. And as we look at India, that is a, what you might call perhaps one of the cutting edge leaders of the future in development. I've seen a book by a friend of mine, Ajay Shah from India and five other people, six of them, about how does India respond in light of the U.S.-China anxiety? How do you see uh, what you might call the priority of resilience emerging and what kind of effect will it have and how, how does one construct resilience? So it is rising as a priority, um, you know, and it's not just in the business world uh, where they, you know, in the past we had shocks, but they, and they talked a lot about, you know, tightly wound supply chains and choke points and things like that, but nothing really happened. Right. Uh, I remember in the, when the Japanese tsunami hit, there was a, a particular auto part, <laughs> that virtually every automaker in the world uses that was produced somewhere near, you know, the, and it was, anyway, it was destroyed in the tsunami and it brought, it brought the, you know, a temporary halt, screeching halt in the automobile industry. I, this is different now. You know, Europe is this high speed energy transition because of the war, the Russian Ukraine war. Um, but it's going way, way beyond that. I mean, when I, I talk to friends who are on boards, you know, every boardroom is having a discussion of diversifying their supply chain so they don't get caught. And then you have policy backing it up, right? I mean, uh, it, the, the policy motivations are multiple. Uh, some of it's just plain resilience, we, or we don't want to be held hostage, you know, if we're dependent. Um, some, some of it is uh, distributional, right? You know, some of this kind of home shoring, friend shoring stuff is motivated in part by relieving some of the kind of negative distributional pressures that go with full throated uh, kind of unfettered global trade. And, and then some of it's just plain flat out, uh, you know, either holding China back some national security agenda or, or restraining them. And, and it, it's growing. I mean, you know, the president just announced expanded restrictions on private equity and venture capital investments in China, in particular areas that are viewed as sensitive. But one, one of those areas is AI, and AI is everywhere, right? So it's a little bit like the national security law in China. You know, you're not allowed to pass national security information, but nobody knows exactly what that is, right? And so the fear factor is causing people, you know, to hold back. Uh, so there's a, just a lot of turmoil uh, around this. And, you know, I, I, it's an important part of it, it's not going to go away. I mean, I, I, you know, I think that where Gordon and others, you know, Ngozi at the um, WTO, uh, many people. And, and by the way, I would say most of the emerging economies in the world other than China, you know, want to go is a, a new form of globalization, the kind of thing that Danny Roderick talks about a lot, um, you know, which isn't, you know, as uncomplicated <laughs> as the old one and simple, not driven only by market incentives. We have to acknowledge these other things are real and they're going to be a factor. 
Um, but it, it's one thing to admit that it's a more complex world that we have to adapt to. And it's quite another thing to, uh, to abandon multilateralism and the institutions that support it. Um, the last thing I'll say is, you know, it, in, in, it, it's transparently clear that the vast majority of countries in the world do not want to go down the road, you know, driven mainly by U.S., China or U.S. and Europe and China <laughs> tensions. And they've made it transparently clear. And, you know, their voice matters. You know, when you add up India and Indonesia and Brazil and a whole lot of other countries that, you know, they have something to say. Um, and and India has been particularly skillful at not taking sides. Right. They have kind of productive relationships with Russia. They don't sign up to the sanctions. They have pretty good relationships with uh, the United States and maybe not quite that we're quite there in, in the case of China. But I, so I think that's kind of where we are. Uh, what our hope is that the G20, w w because of its important leadership position, there is no alternative to the G20, um, will accept the complexity, but, but try to drive for a workable new version of multilateralism that's inclusive, that includes the global South, that doesn't put the emerging economies in the position of having to sort of pick sides or be subject to, you know, contradictory restrictions coming from China, the United States, Europe, and other places. And the United States, by the way, is, is losing ground because of our expansive use of economic and financial policies to pursue other ends, right? I mean, there's a serious probably not imminent search for alternatives to the U.S. dollar uh, and its function in the global financial system. There's talk about, you know, central bank digital currencies and the trading of them, you know, being an, a possible longer term alternative. Again, none of this is imminent, but it it's a, a clear signal that people don't want either one country or two, you know, dictating what's what goes on in the global economy and uh, that should resonate in india i mean because india is on, on on a on a course to become a you know a third or fourth major major power economically in the global economy but it you know it's going to take a few more years before they they're in the kind of china category well, one of the things that uh, I know you and I have been to the China Development Forum at the you know together at the same time in a number of years, but a lot of meetings that I've had with Chinese leaders were all about well you got this thing called Silicon Valley, and it's great these platforms the digital commerce, but we we're not really very comfortable letting the Americans deploy their platforms because we think the side effect is they can collect data on us for their intelligence community. And they talk about how DARPA and uh, other elements of the CIA and others had contributed to the formation of Silicon Valley. Well, now I have people, I was on a panel with some people from Huawei about 5G and various things around the management of ports and so forth. My own nautical interest uh, inspired me to join the panel. And uh, then they start to talk about how now American, American intelligence community people who are acquaintances of mine came to me after I did that panel and said, Rob, that's all fine and everything, but now when the Chinese are at the cutting edge digitally, they can collect information for their intelligence committee. In other words, there's a side effect to the digital commerce that relates to national security issues. And it's almost like the same argument China made about their anxiety of working with America is now in reverse. And I see India fascinating in this regard. The reason I brought it up is not just to wallow in U.S.-China, but the digital advances in India, given the state of what I'll call their manufacturing, other types of development, I think is very promising. And you've talked about with me or Montek and other, Montek Singh Alawali in the distant past, about the Indian platforms and the Indian financial system and other things is kind of 
I want to say uh, it's ahead of the crowd now. It's it's moving to, or has been at the cutting edge in some dimensions. Well, that's true. I mean, there's no question about that. You know, when the earlier round was, uh, well, Rajiv Gandhi got India investing heavily in engineering and computer science and so on. That produced uh, a really significant uh, burst of, you know, in the, in the what you might call the outsourcing business. Uh, technology-driven outsourcing, business process, you know, tech administration and so on, big business. Uh, and now India has, you know, uh, made several leaps forward. I mean, you have the the digital identity system, you have the universal payments interface, which means basically other other players can compete with each other in the kind of digital finance area. I've been really struck by the, the speed with which the um, – the mobile payment system is spread in rural India, for example, you know, all kinds of, you know, junk, like, you know, you have to go and stand in line at the bank, you know, it's gone, gone, gone away. Uh, and India is also, uh, I think, smartly, um, you know, leverage global technology, but not allow foreigners, either Chinese or American, to dominate the local landscape, Right. Uh, and I think you're going to, you know, successful countries and regions, you know, Europe has not done that. Europe does not have a big cloud computing system. It does not have a major mega platform resident domestically and so on. It's a huge disadvantage. And I think India saw that, saw that China, you know, if they kind of sat back, you know, that the Alibabas and Tencents and, you know, others would kind of check in and kind of eventually dominate the market. They stopped that. And I don't I, I'm not inclined to be critical of that. This is an aspect of kind of sophisticated industrial policy in a way, you know, that you there's certain capabilities because of their huge positive sort of external spinoff effects that you want to have re- and, and, and control issues that you want to have resident in Italy. And then you have the geo revolution. I mean, you know, the India went from, you know, in the early 2000 and teens, you know, low penetration of mobile phones, high data rates, and so on, practically overnight, and certainly in a five-year period, to 400 million or more incremental subscribers, low data rates, and, a, and, a, and, and that created the underpinning for a kind of burgeoning sort of uh, digital, you know, platform-based, you know, system, Right. With 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 you know Reliance Geo a major player, but the Americans as you know co investors are are in that Google, um, Meta, a uh, bunch of elite you know private investors and so on. It, it's just really impressive, um, and I you know I think you and I have talked about this, but I think you know the the both the, the progress and the balance you know so nobody has all the power and whatnot that India has managed to achieve with a combination of government policy and private sector initiative really is an impressive, um, you know, example that can be replicated in one form or another um, in a wide variety of developing countries. It's not the whole of the development story, but it's a pretty important part, you know, in terms of, you know, financial inclusion, you know, an efficient financial system, a payment system, you know, with a payment system, uh, you collect a lot of data. You can just do a whole lot better and more inclusive job in supplying credit to people than you can in any known alternative, including the first microfinance re- revolution. This is kind of, I think of this as a sustainable version of microfinance, a sustainable, scalable version of microfinance. And India is uh, no, not alone in this, you know, my aunt financial and others have led a similar, you know, sort of movement in, in China, again, leveraging the same batches of data. You know, every, I think everybody knows, I mean, it's worth saying, but, you know, when you're going to go down this road, then you need a parallel process of defining and refining the rules and policies, norms and ethics that go with the responsible and secure management of data. And I think everybody understands that. And if you don't do that, then you get all kinds of negative side effects, you know, that you don't want. Um, but but I don't think those negative side effects should deter you from going down that road. You just have to 
you just have to be careful about the parallel process. Yeah. Well, we've seen in the United States thinkers like Tim O'Reilly and uh, at O'Reilly Media and others talking about how we have commerce and there are ways you use the technology to enhance commerce, but we also have what you might call the public good platforms that are digital that have, let's just call side effects that we need to be conscious of and manage. And yes. seeing this next phase where India is very sophisticated and involved in vibrant development, one can imagine what you might call platforms for the public good, much as Luhan talks about in Africa, contain tremendous potential. But I will say along with Permacrisis, my other, uh, how they say, most exciting book of the summer has been Power and Progress by uh, yeah. Darren Asimoglu and uh, Simon, Simon Johnson. Johnson. Yeah. What they did was they did something slightly different. They said, we can see this technology on the frontier, but let's look at the historic analogies of how the public good of technological change was managed, because there have been horrendous mistakes and tremendous successes. Let's learn yeah, How it's do incredibly you use useful. power to create win-win progress? And yeah. they did a very, yeah. very nice job in economic history, bringing us to the frontier of that challenge, which you and your co-authors are, uh, how do you say, even more deep in illuminating the present challenge. Well, you know, it brings, I mean, it's an important book and it, there are lessons and the notion that technology just goes along on its own, you know, kind of path with no influence that's just rubbish and and the, you know that their book uh, you know makes it clear that we can guide this uh, and we can um i think you know the current version of that is this these powerful new artificial intelligence tools generative ai is amazing i mean it uh I know there's hype and there'll be excess valuations and all kinds of stuff that go along with it. But fundamentally, I mean, you know, when I, I've been talking with AI people as, you know, I mean, researchers, as as many others have, um, up until recently, you know, the artificial intelligence common, you know, wisdom was the AIs work in well-defined domains and then, you know, don't work so well, you know, when the domain is not well defined, you know what I mean? So this is software, this is it. And then along comes, you know, chat GPT and the large language models, and they don't have any trouble switching domains at all. You know, <laughs> in addition, you know, basically you can ask them about anything, you know, they're not the whole story because there's lots of specific use cases and applications that are going to be built either separately or on top of them. Uh, but, you know, they have, you don't have to be an expert to use them. I mean, ChatGPT had 100 million users in the first two months because anybody can ask a question. And after a little experience, they learn how to make, you know, prompts that yield useful responses. Um, and and it's got applications everywhere. I mean, I, I think there really is a chance. It, let me put it this way. I thought the odds of a productivity surge were pretty high before it, the LLMs and generative AI came along, I thought those odds jumped up <laughs> quite a lot, you know, with the arrival of this. Um, and and so we're in a period of experimentation now. But it's just stunning what these things do. I mean, you know, like there's uh, this thing called ambient intelligence. So these, you know, an AI system can kind of listen to doctors and nurses going around seeing patients in a hospital, watch right um fix errors you know write up the first draft of reports i mean medical people spend a I mean, these reports are important right medical medical people including doctors spend astonishing amounts of time documenting what they've just done right I mean, their estimates 30 40 percent of their time three hours at night after a full day's work the ais you know can do they're not going to it's not going to automate that, right? I mean, I, I think the the powerful digital assistant model is the right way to think about this, at least for the foreseeable future. I mean, you know, these are prediction machines. They occasionally say something truly stupid. You know, they make stuff up occasionally and whatnot. 
nobody, you know, with any kind of sense of caution is going to delegate the whole thing um, to, you know, to an AI, at, for at least not in the immediate or, in the, you know, any time in the near future. But if 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 an AI can produce for a doctor, you know, a, ver- a pretty good first draft that the person can edit in 15 to 20 percent of the time they took writing it. And then it just, you know, every time you turn around, you can find uh, kind of uses of that in, in, in the. I think I'm not suggesting this is reading for our audience here, but Eric Bernolfsson and colleagues did a, a case study. Uh, it was, you know, customer service, which would be pretty interesting in India. And AI enabled, basically listened to thousands and thousands of hours of audio, customer service, you know, and and then was trained on that data combined with performance measures, standard ones, like did they solve the problem? Did, did it take a long time? You know, did the customer get really angry and frustrated, et cetera? Um, and, the, you know, and then they kind of gave it, I mean, this was a, a real case. They were writing about a case that was actually done. They gave the AI to a subset of people, customer service agents, spectrum of experience and performance um, and not to others. And, you know, they got a 14% uh, productivity increase. And but the thing that struck me most, Rob, about that paper was that the, the, you got a benefit from having the AI as a digital assistant. Uh, the benefit at the kind of most experienced end was noticeable. But at the bottom end, you know, the less experienced people, where there's a lot of turnover, was huge, right? It's a kind of learning curve leveling up effect right which isn't surprising yeah and and it has you know attractive distributional characteristics when you look at how it plays out in the marketplace at least it could depending on the behavior of employers but anyway i think when you cut through all the hype the potential here is is pretty astounding and um i think every major country including india needs to make sure that they're part of the process of, I mean, at the forefront, you know, of, of developing, that these tools are accessible. Uh, I mean, to train a large language model takes an astonishing amount of computing power, right? Basically, it's the cloud computing people who have the power to, you know, the, enough computing power to do this. And it's a very significant policy question is, you know, is this going to be accessible to a very wide range of players in the economy, small, medium sized businesses? You know, is there enough competition? Can we just do it hands off? These are all questions that don't necessarily have answers right now, but they're important questions that have a direct effect on how fast and how comprehensive um, the productivity and other performance enhancing characteristics of these potential of these technologies is realized or not. Well, coming down the home stretch here, I think yep. uh, the, what you just illuminated is right in cutting edge for India. But I, I look at India as the head of the G20, yep. coming out of Indonesia, heading towards Brazil. The focus on the global south in relation to climate is, how would I say, I applaud tremendously that they have made that a central emphasis. The questions of financing in the next phase with regard to climate. And now, how would I say, your final thoughts, perhaps echoing what we've just talked about, is that India is at a place where it is large, at the cutting edge of development in the digital world, How would you advise the country's leaders, not as a G20, what's the, what you might call the recipe for success in this next chapter? Well, part of it is is kind of, it sounds trite in a way, because it's always been there as education, right? You know, so you need universal education that's either free or so low cost, you don't want you want um, quality measures. You don't want teachers not showing up. You know, you want, and basically you want to produce a, a, a young population that's an asset rather than 
a liability. Um, and, and so access and all that. And I think that's well understood in India. And the, you know, implementing these things isn't easy, right? So you can't just snap your fingers and say, this is a huge problem in South Africa. They just have not succeeded in overcoming that huge sort of divide that, that was the legacy of the apartheid system. And then, you know, under Z the Zuma administration, you kind of lost the thread, basically, and stopped working on it uh, for an extended period of time. And now they have a huge, uh, yeah, a huge problem. But but I think in, you know, on. I think that I've always thought that India has a, an. First of all, it's not followed the Asian growth growth model, or or, or if it has, it's a, it's a pretty mild version of it. So I think the question that still remains for for India is what are the employment engines, right? You need very very powerful employment engines to produce inclusive growth patterns. I mean, one of the things that the Asian growth model, you know, produced was just mountains and mountains of employment in what were initially export sectors, right? These were labor intensive by design. They were initially supposed to be in the capital intensive side. Um, and so I think that's a remaining challenge for India. You know, is there another development model? If India sort of figures this out and solves the problem, uh, then, you know, it's gonna be um, an earth shattering development that ought to be replicated everywhere as the kind of manufacturing sector, you know, eventually gravitates over to, um, over to the digital side and, you know, and every economy becomes somehow a service economy. Um, I think, you know, uh, other than that, it's, uh, there's relatively few things that I've seen going on in India on the economic front, um, that look to me to be, um, a problem on the on the climate change. I, you know, I think. Uh, I mean, when we were working together, Montek Alawali and I on the Growth Commission, you know, the problem was coal was by far the dirtiest and cheapest source of electricity. I think that's probably less true now. It is less true, right? I mean, in India, presumably has tremendous capacity to build alternative energy sources. But I suspect that a full-throated um, domestic agenda on the climate change front that you and Adair and others will talk about is probably deserves to be on a list of things that, you know, are top priorities for the, for the Indian leadership. Well, as you say in the book, Permacrisis, when you move to be at the center of the growth engine, for the world today, you have to be careful how you deploy carbon burning in in that uh, in that development strategy. So it's a it's a yeah. consciousness given. How would I say? Given the size and scale of the population, I think it's an important issue at an important time. Yeah, I think India is at the point where it needs to start thinking carefully about what it means to be one of the economic giants in the global economy. Yes. Yes. It, it really is. You know, it's not next year, but it's not that far away. And it's no. by far, I mean, India has, I think, the highest growth potential of any major economy in the world. Yes. And and for the most part, that seems, it seems to be delivering on that potential, which is really good. Yes. It's good for everybody. It's certainly well, good for I was going to say, their rising tide raises all boats, potentially, yeah, exactly. if, if yep. they've done well. Well, Mike, this has been, uh, how do they say, very invigorating, as I, I must say, as I expected. Uh, and in reading your book, is, when is your book, Permacrisis, to be released? So it's going to be published in, you know, at the end of September. I think it's the 28th in the UK and simultaneously distributed in the U.S. Okay. Um, and then there, I hope there's a reasonably rapid process of, uh, of moving that out around the world. Um, okay. Of course, many Indians, you know, read English well and probably will have access to it. But, uh, but anyway, that's that, that that's the current. It was done on a reasonably compressed schedule, given the way the publishing industry normally operates. Yeah, that's so, great. Yeah. Well, that how they say uh, we'll get them that and Eric Bjorn Nielsen's paper that you uh, referred to, and I would I say INET. 
and Cedric will be standing by to help in any way we can. But thank you well, for your help today, and thank you for the uh, tremendous insights that you bring to our profession and to our world.